Unit 9.3, Beam Deflection by Superposition. In this unit, we have focused on the following course outcome. Demonstrate the ability to calculate normal and shear stress and deflection in beams. In this lesson, we will focus on demonstrating the ability to find beam deflection using deflection tables and superposition. In the previous lesson, we used the deflection by integration method to find equations that define the deflected shape of a beam and equations for maximum deflection in a beam. The results found using deflection by integration for various loading conditions are compiled in beam deflection tables, like the one shown. Beam deflection tables can be found in many engineering references and through a search on the internet. Deflection tables can be found for a variety of beam types. The beams shown on this deflection table are simply supported beams with supports at the beam ends. The deflection tables provide equations for beam slopes at specific points, beam deflection at specific points, and the elastic curve. For example, let's look at the top row. Here's a simply supported beam with a point load right in the center. The deflection table gives values for the slopes theta1 and theta2, which are shown in the figure. Here is theta1 on the left end, theta2 on the right end. It also gives an equation for the maximum deflection, where v represents deflection. And in the picture we see that the max deflection occurs right at the middle of the beam. And we also get an equation for the elastic curve. The equation that is shown is valid for x is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to L over 2. Let's look at the axis system on the beams. You can see that the horizontal axis is the x-axis. and It's going positive to the right with the origin at the left support. The deflection is shown positive upward. That's why you see a negative sign on the Vmax equation. This, we expect the deflection below this point load to be downward, so it'll have a negative value. The elastic curve equation defines the deflected shape shown by the dotted line, and the equation given is uh, defines the shape of the elastic curve from x equals 0, which is at the left support, to the midpoint. If you need to define the deflection on the other half of the beam, you can recognize that this is a symmetrically loaded beam, and so the, uh, the right half looks like the mirror image of the left half. Here is a deflection table for cantilever beams under a variety of loading conditions. Note, however, that the loading conditions for the cantilever beams and the simply supported beams we just saw are relatively simple. Suppose you have a beam with both a distributed load and one or more point loads. For example, uh, here is a cantilever beam with both a distributed load and a point load right in the center. Suppose we wanted to find the maximum deflection in the beam. Well, we can use the principle of superposition, and we can use the deflection tables. We can use the deflection table results for a cantilever beam with just a single point load at the center, and we can use the deflection table results for a cantilever beam with a distributed load. And if we're trying to find the maximum deflection, we see from the figures that the maximum deflection occurs at the free end under both loading conditions. So we can take the maximum deflection from the point load and add it to the maximum deflection from the distributed load to get our total load. This is the application of the principle of superposition. And there is a limit, and that limit is that the beam must still be behaving linearly elastically. How do we check to know if it is still linear elastic? Well, we would compute the maximum stresses in the beam and then compare those values to the yield stresses for whatever the beam material will be. Now we could also use the elastic curve equations to find the deflection at any point along the beam, including at the end of the beam, where it is at a maximum. And we would do that just by combining the elastic curve equations for both conditions. Now, when using the beam deflection by superposition, there are some potential sources of error that should be mentioned. First of all, the units. If you look at the equation shown, the variables are, for example, in this first row, P is the load, L is the length, E and I are, is the flexural rigidity, where E is the modulus of elasticity and I is the moment of inertia. If we are considering U.S. customary units, the units for modulus of elasticity are typically kips per square inch. For 
moment of inertia typically inches to the fourth power. That means our units uh, for load and length must match. So inches and kips, or inches and pounds. If we have an applied moment, then we would want to use units of kip inches. And our value for x that we will plug into the elastic curve equation will also be in the same units, inches. If we use units of kips and inches in our equation, then, our, then the units on our deflection will be in inches. In SI units, it's somewhat simpler. But we must pay close attention to the units that we're using. The units for slope using these equations will be in radians. Another potential source of error has to do with the location of the deflection that is being calculated. Consider this beam shown. It's a simply supported beam with a partial distributed load and a point load. If we were interested in finding the maximum deflection in this beam, we would go to the deflection tables and find these two rows of information that match the two different loads on our beam. Under a single point load, we see that the maximum deflection occurs right below that point load. However, under the partial distributed load, the maximum deflection is not shown in the diagram. In the deflection column of the table, where the max deflection is typically listed, we see that the deflection that is given is simply the deflection at the point x equals a, where a is defined in the picture. It turns out that this is not the point of maximum deflection. And the point of maximum deflection is not necessarily at the center of the beam. So if we were to simply take these two equations and add them together, that would give us an incorrect answer for maximum deflection. So be careful and do not assume that you can always just add the equations for maximum deflection together. It depends on where the maximum is occurring. We cannot tell where the maximum will occur uh, in in this beam, uh, but we could find it by using the elastic curve equations for both loading scenarios. The third potential source of error has to do with the direction of the deflection. For example, consider this beam with a concentrated moment applied at the left end. If we go to the deflection tables to find our equations for deflection, we will find this beam shown here. And notice that the moment on this beam is in the opposite direction to the moment that we have in our problem. Well, that's no big deal. The way we will handle this is by putting a negative sign on the moments in each of our equations. We can see that when we have a moment as shown in the deflection table, that will create a negative deflection. But if we reverse the direction of the moment, that will cause the deflection to be positive. And that's what we'll get when we change the sign on the moment in our elastic curve equation. And we're done.